All right, guys, welcome back to part three of the integumentary system practice test. So again, there are three parts. We're all going through practice questions on the integumentary system. So number 20, which of the following is a possible explanation for why accessory structures are down in the dermis? Remember that our accessory structures are like our hair and our nails and our glands. And a lot of these things reach up past the surface of our skin, right? Your hair goes through the epidermis and all the way out past um, the skin's surface. But these accessory structures are actually anchored or located down deeper in the dermis. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, because they're made from dermal connective tissue? No. Uh, the accessory structures, um, or some of them, like the hair follicle, for example, are actually made out of epithelial tissue. Okay, so they're not they're not all made out of connective tissue. That doesn't make sense because they contain active tissues that need a blood supply. That sounds like a viable response. Um, the hair grows, so it has living dividing cells down at the bottom. Nails grow, so there must be living dividing cells. Um, your sweat glands and your sebaceous glands or oil glands, they make products. So they have cells that produce these secretions. Um, these accessory structures are living, they're functioning. So they do need a blood supply. And remember that the, epi, the um, epithelial tissue, the epidermis, that is avascular. It does not have any blood. So it would make sense that things down in the dermis have a better have better access to a blood supply. Um, so B looks good to me. Because the dermis is closer to the surface than the epidermis? No. Um, that just doesn't make sense at all, right? That's not true. The dermis is deep underneath the epidermis. Because the epidermis is too fatty for the accessory structures. No, again, that doesn't make sense. Um, the epidermis is not fatty. The hypodermis is, it has adipose tissue, but that's not a problem anyway. Um, so blood supply is a good reason. Remember the other reason we said is just to anchor the structures. The epidermis is really thin um, and it's just right at the surface of your skin. So if the hair, for example, began in the epidermis, it wouldn't be deep enough to actually anchor it and hold it and we would just lose our hairs. They would fall out even easier than they already do. Okay, so blood supply and to anchor the structures. When the erector pili muscle contracts, remember that the erector pili muscle um, is a muscle that's attached to the hair root. Okay, so um, it's attached to the hair root and this is a smooth muscle. You don't consciously control it. When it contracts, it pulls the hair up. Okay, so your hairs stand up on end and you get goosebumps. This is pointless in us, um, but in other animals that have hair, dense hair covering their body, this is a protective mechanism. Okay, so the muscle contracts when you're scared and when you're cold. The reason for that is when you're cold and your hair stands up on end, when you have a lot of it, it acts as a better insulator and it warms the animal. The reason that this happens, that the, the erector pili muscle contracts when you're scared, is that when you have hair all over you and it stands up, now you look bigger. Okay? And if you have two similar sized animals that are, are threatening each other or are going to fight, and now your hair stands up, you look like a more formidable opponent. You're now larger and the other person is, is more likely to back up and to leave you be. Um, again, this is just useless in us at this point. We don't have that much hair that's thick covering our bodies, um, but we still have an erector pili muscle. Okay, so it still does make our hair stand up. I'm sure that um, you've seen this when you're really cold and have goosebumps, or if you've ever gotten um, really frightened and you can feel you know, the hair on the back of your neck stand up, that's because of the erector pili muscle. If you have an experience that I'm sure you've seen is in like a dog or a cat, Right, when they go crazy and get all riled up, you can see their hair stand up, and this is why. So, when the erector pili muscles contract, hair stands up? Yes. Hairs are shed? No, that has nothing to do with us. Goosebumps form? Yes. Um, shivering occurs? No, that's, those are completely different muscles. 
Um, shivering uh, is from your, your general skeletal muscles, right? They contract and relax, and that makes you shiver. That's not your erector pili muscles. So A and C are correct. Hair stands up in goosebumps form. Or I could ask you, when does this happen? Right? I could say, when does the erector pili muscle contract? And then you would say, when we're scared um, or cold. Sensible perspiration is produced by, um, remember I said that there are two different types of perspiration or water loss, sensible and insensible. Insensible is just evaporation. Sensible perspiration is the sweat that we make to cool the body off. Okay, so which glands make that sweat? Ceruminous glands, those make earwax to protect your eardrum. Okay, so no, they make cerumen or earwax. Apocrine glands, apocrine glands are not the best choice here. Apocrine glands are sweat glands um, and they produce sweat, but they only start working at puberty. So that would not be sensible perspiration in an eight year old. Um, they only start working at puberty and they release sweat when we're, when we're nervous or due to hormonal signals. And remember they release sweat in the underarms and in the groin and that this has to do with pheromone secretion. This is not the sweat that's intended to cool the body off. So that's really not the greatest choice here. Merocrine or eccrine glands, that's a good choice. These are the sweat glands that make the salty sweat that's released all over the body that cools the body down. And these are active throughout life. Okay, so if I'm talking about a six-year-old, um, their eccrine glands are going to produce sweat and release that fluid, and that's going to be their sensible perspiration. Okay, so C is, C is a good choice here. Um, sebaceous glands produce sebum, that's oil, right? So oil that can be released like onto the face and the chest, the back, or it can be released onto a hair follicle, right? So that's why your hair gets oily or greasy if you don't wash it. That's from sebaceous glands. Um, mammary glands produce breast milk. After um, an infant or a baby is born, then the mammary glands start to make breast milk in response to a hormone called prolactin. Okay, that is an outsensible perspiration. So the best answer for sens sensible perspiration is the eccrine or merocrine glands. Glands that secrete an oily secretion to help control bacterial populations and lubricate the hairs. We just mentioned this. That is the sebaceous gland. Okay? Sebaceous glands make oil. Which of the following is false concerning apocrine glands? So we just talked about apocrine glands, right? Those are the pheromone ones, the ones that become active at puberty. So which of the following is false? Which of these are not true? Apocrine glands are sudoriferous glands. Yes, they are. Sudoriferous glands are sweat glands. Um, and we said we have two different types of sweat glands, um, apocrine and eccrine. Okay, so they are sudoriferous, that's true. Apocrine glands are located all over the body. No. We said they're located in areas where we get hair at puberty. So mostly the axilla, the underarm, and the groin area. Um, sometimes around the nipples, especially in men, um, but the axilla and the groin are the most common areas. So B is false. They are not located all over the body. Let's keep looking though. Apocrine glands produce a cloudy, sticky secretion. Yes, this is true. Um, the sweat from apocrine glands is not this clear, salty sweat. Um, it's, it's a yuckier sweat. It's cloudy and sticky. When it breaks down, it smells bad. Um, so that C is true. Apocrine glands become active at puberty. Yes, that's also true. So the only one that is false is B, that they're located all over the body. And they are not, they're the axilla and the groin. And that's it. I hope that was helpful. Again, as you guys go through this, start to think about other questions as well. I start to think about clinical questions or patient cases where I could ask you about this kind of stuff. Um, discuss the answers with each other, really, really work through them well, and that should help you prepare for your exam.